recording again, and I just remembered, so I just pushed the record button again. Um, so anyways, uh, we've seen a number of definitions of what a green building is. Right, a green building is a building that has a substantially reduced impact on the natural environment. And just as important, a building that provides indoor conditions conducive to human health, right? So if we are really doing our jobs well, we are doing both of those things at the same time. We are reducing impact of the building on the natural environment. And we also do it in a way that provides a healthy place for us as human beings to be inside because we are inside buildings most of the time. So what are some of the aspects of green building? Again, we've talked about these things already. We'll talk about them again. We'll talk about them a lot. Um, site selection, where do we put the building? Or ideally, hopefully, we are adaptively reusing an existing building. We talked about what adaptive reuse means. Ideally, we are building or redeveloping on an existing site as opposed to a greenfield site. Greenfield would mean out in the country someplace. Hopefully we are close in to an already developed area. Hopefully we are developing our building or reusing, adaptively reusing our building in a place where there is access to public transportation. And Ideally, our site has access to the sunlight and wind. Uh, we talked a little last week about net zero energy, right? To have a net zero energy building, we're going to need some way of having the sunshine on, a, on the roof of our building or on the envelope of our building to, to generate electricity on site. So hopefully we're in a place where that's possible. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in the design of the building systems, just like the natural world that we just saw with Habitat Earth, right? In the natural world, all the different parts and pieces all work together. They, they fit together in an ecosystem. All those connections between producers and consumers, those connections have come about through, you know, thousands and thousands of years of of evolution, right? Those, those connections have been built up over time. You know, we as human beings don't necessarily have thousands and thousands of years to design and construct our buildings, right? Your client wants the building designed and built quickly. So if we want to design a building where all the parts and pieces fit together, then we have to have a some kind of integrated design an integrated design process. Integrated design means that all the different components of the building, the building envelope, the glazing systems, the lighting, the mechanical systems, the controls, they're all designed together and they're designed to work together. Right? That's integrated design. All the parts and pieces fit together. Um, we're going to look at the process of how the building is constructed. Um, site management. We want to prevent um, runoff from the site. We want to uh, prevent damage to trees and vegetation that might exist in our, in our project site. We obviously want to make sure that the, um, sorry, I missed the L there in health. Um, I think I did, I did spell check, but not reality check. Uh, that should be workplace health with an L, health and safety. Um, we talked about but use of benign materials, right? Benign being not harmful. So we want to make sure that there's no exposure to toxins as part of the as part of the uh, construction process. We want to look at the paints and and adhesives and coatings and all the different things that go into the building and make sure that we're not exposing uh, the workers to harmful chemicals as part of building the building. Uh, another thing about the construction process, we want to make sure that we protect, protect 
the building materials and the building itself from from water from the rain during the during the process of construction. The last thing we want to do is is have wet materials going into the building. Uh, those wet materials would be a great place for mold to grow. Mold is unhealthy, so we want to prevent that. Um, aspects of green building, uh, operation of the building. Uh, I think Susan, we we you asked about this last week, maybe uh, commissioning. Commissioning is is a systematic process of of testing out the systems in a in a completed or nearly completed uh, the commissioning authority will will attempt to discern was the building that was actually built did it did it meet the intent of the designers do the systems work the way that the designers had intended them to work are we getting all the the integration between the various components that we thought we would get when we designed the building right that's part of what commissioning does. Uh, training is important as well, right? We have to, the staff who is going to operate and run the building, they have to know how to run it, right? They have to know all the things that the designers intended when they put all the, the components and sensors and things in the building. And um, also we have to make sure we account for anything that we are asking the occupants to do. Do the occupants have any role in the operation of the building? In a lot of cases, they don't, but in some cases, they might, right? We might have um, commercial buildings with operable windows, right? Obviously, in your, in your home, you know enough to open and close the window depending on the conditions that are going on. In some cases, we want occupants in the building to, say, open and close windows or operate uh, shading, et cetera. So what role do the occupants have in the operation of the building? Um, maintenance is an important aspect of green building. Uh, we talked about this. Uh, the supplies, janitorial supplies and procedures, uh, what types of materials are used to clean the building and maintain the building. Um, again, in the, to, to really drive toward the performance we're looking for, we have to monitor. We have to look and see how how the building is performing. Look at the energy bills. Are we actually achieving what we set out to achieve? We may have to test systems on an ongoing on an ongoing basis. We certainly have to maintain them on an ongoing basis. Again, a, a part of green building will be performance verification. I think one of the rating systems we talked about last week. Um, you you achieve your, your rating by showing, by demonstrating that, that the building has actually achieved its, its stated performance goals. And the last piece uh, is waste management. How, how did we handle waste during the construction process? How are, how are wastes handled as part of the operation and maintenance of the building? We'll see how these aspects of green building will fit into the lead rating system. So again, why are we concerning ourselves with building efficient, building green buildings? Uh, we looked at these same slides last week, but they, they bear looking at again. Obviously buildings are an important part, probably the largest single part of the energy use in the United States, certainly a large portion of electricity consumption, CO2 emissions, a uh, smaller part of water consumption. We saw before that a lot of the water goes to agriculture and, and to generate electricity. Right, 21 plus 19, that's 40% of the United States energy use goes to buildings. And if we as construction professionals know our job well, right, if we have integrated design, if we do all those other things that we just talked about, we have the potential of reducing energy use, GHG or greenhouse gas emissions, 
and also reducing maintenance costs. The figures that I have on the screen there are from the GSA, the Government Services Administration, I think that's what it stands for. Those are the folks that run buildings for the federal government, right? The GSA is the, is the largest landlord, the largest operator of buildings in the United States. So they did a study of green buildings and found that, yes, in fact, a well-designed and well-operated green building reduces energy use, reduces greenhouse gas emissions, and most importantly, has lower operating and maintenance costs. But just as important, you know, we said there are two sides to the coin, right? We want to reduce resource usage, and we also want to do it in a way that provides a healthy environment for the people who are inside the building. For us, right? We're inside buildings. You know, we're not we're not sitting in a classroom at at Triton College like we would be under a, a you know maybe more normal times. But we're all presumably sitting in our homes. Maybe some of you are sitting someplace else. But you know, we spend an awful lot of our time, 90% of our more of our time indoors. So how healthy our buildings are is more is very important. How productive our buildings are are very important. Again, generally speaking, a, a well designed, well, well operated, a well maintained green building has better indoor air quality, better lighting. 27% higher levels of occupant satisfaction. So again, a study reported that people who are in a green building are more, are happier with their interior environment. That's important. So again, let's think about some of the ways that we get here. We're gonna talk about systems thinking, right? This was the, a lot of the point of, of what we just saw in Habitat Earth, and I've showed you the same slide before on a number of occasions, right? So just like the, the natural systems upon which all the stuff that we do depends, the built environment is also composed of a series of interrelated systems that form a whole. So what do I mean by built environment? A built environment, I mean the things that we as human be, we as humans build for ourselves, the buildings, the structures um, that we build, the schools, the homes, the hospitals, et cetera, et cetera, right? That's the built environment. So just like in a natural system, the built environment is composed of a series of systems that hopefully work together to form a whole. So we need to think about things from a systems point of view. So again, in, in systems thinking, a couple aspects come into play. Number one would be feedback. We want to use sensors, information, or controls to change the operation of systems in a building. And I think when we when you walk through the, the health sciences building or the H building when you're on campus, uh, may, I may have pointed it out, maybe I didn't, I can't remember whether, but in that building we have we have occupancy sensors that will turn lights off in classrooms depending on um, whether it senses that anyone is in that space. So again, from a technology standpoint, the cost of this sort of systems, these sensors and this information is coming down such that that, that can be made part of the building. Uh, we wanna look for leverage. Some of, these, some of these concepts I'm struggling a little bit to explain, I'll do my best. Um, uh, when we think in a systems fashion, we wanna look for places where a small intervention can have a large impact right the uh i mean maybe a good example of leverage is the uh is the uh rain gardens at the at the h building right again that's a fairly modest intervention you know capturing rainwater off the roof and channeling it to a place where 
where native plants are growing, but that can have a large impact. It has multiple impacts. So that's an example of leverage. We want to look, we want to look for those sorts of things when we, when we get together and design our buildings. <clears throat> we also want to think in a life cycle fashion. So two different ways of thinking in a life cycle fashion. When we look at the, the goods and the materials that go into our building, we might do or have somebody do what's called a life cycle assessment. All right, so we look at the full impact of that product or that material over its life cycle. Where did it come from? How was it processed? How was it transported? Right, not just the, not just the, the, the piece of lumber, but what did it take to, how was that piece of lumber, or how was that material produced? Also, when we think about costs for a green building, we want to think about costs more holistically. Quite often, um, you know, we're looking to minimize first cost or to, you know, bring the first cost of the structure in within, within a certain budget. In the case of a green building, we want to expand that. And we also want to, we want to look at not only the first cost, but also the cost of operation and maintenance over time, right? This is thinking about things more broadly. Um, ideally, if we do our jobs as, as designers and construction professionals well, then the green building that we're designing and building shouldn't cost that much more than a quote unquote conventional building. And really the benefit comes into play over the long haul because we have a building where utility costs are lower, costs for electricity, natural gas, water, et cetera, are, are less, and the costs of maintenance are less. So that would be looking at the life cycle cost of the building. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the process by which buildings are designed and constructed. So the first part of the process is to think about all the uh, different players, different team members who might be involved in a construction project. Obviously sitting at the top is the owner, right? This is the, the person or the, the organization, you know, with the, with the resources, with the budget, you know, with the need, that we are trying to fulfill. It might be Triton College saying, hey, we want to do a major renovation of this building, turn the H building into a new health sciences building. Right? It may be someone, uh, someone else who says, hey, I'm going to build an office tower or an apartment building, et cetera, et cetera. Um, obviously, other other key member of the team is the architect. Right. Generally speaking, the architect is the one who is who is managing a lot of the things that go on here. Um, MEP engineer, uh, MEP typically stands for mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. So those engineering disciplines are brought to play in the construction process. Um, civil engineer, civil engineer typically concerns themselves with the site, with the grading, with the drainage. Uh, those sorts of things. That's a civil engineer, landscape architect. And then depending on where the site is, uh, there might be a landscape architect who's designing the, the trees and the vegetation around the building. Um, obviously, the contractors, right, the folks that are actually building the building, lots of different ways that contractors can be arranged, different contracting mechanisms, a general contractor or a construction manager, probably a number of different flavors of, of how the contracting actually takes place. Um, commissioning authority, we talked about commissioning. Um, oftentimes in a green building and in many building projects, there'll be a commissioning authority one against the person who comes in near the end of the construction process and and tests systems out, inspects systems to make sure that you know things have actually been built to meet the intent of the designers. Um, facility manager, 
like the person who is going to, or the organization that's going to be responsible to operate and maintain the building, like they should be part of the uh, construction team. Like they want to know what it is that they ultimately will be responsible for. And last but not least, right, the us, the, the, the folks that are going to use the building, the end users, the occupants. Sorry, this slide turned out to be a little bit fuzzy here. I was poking around over the weekend, putting these slides together, looking for images. I just, you know, words on a, some people learn by looking at words on a page. Some people learn by um, listening to the words that I say. And, and many people learn by looking at an image or a graphic. So I, I try to find images that convey what I'm uh, talking about here. So um, a typical way that buildings are built is called what's called a design bid build. I probably should have put a hyphen there between the bid and the build. Um, this, is, this is a more of a linear process where things get handed off from one professional to another, but at the top their pre-design program, right? The owner comes and says, here's what I want to get. Uh, someone does a site analysis to find a, to find a site that's suitable to house that program. The architect typically goes through uh, three stages of design, schematic design, design development, and construction documents where the the design is, is fleshed out in increasing detail. Those CDs or construction documents are then handed off to the construction folks. Typically that is, um, those documents are bid and a contract is awarded. And somebody goes and builds the building per the plan and spec, right, per the construction documents. And someone keeps an eye on the contractor to make sure that he's bid that he's building correctly. So that's a typical kind of more linear design bid build process. Right, here's another way of, of thinking about it. Right, client has a program. They give that program to the design consultant, to the architect. The architect engages engineers to design aspects of the of the project, the mechanical systems, the structural systems, the, the electrical, the plumbing. Those things get put together in a set of construction documents. And ultimately, um, the project gets built. I was looking for images that convey what a more holistic or innovative design process looks like. Again, I was struggling a little bit to find images that convey that. So hopefully I can, I can explain it through um, what I say as well as the images. But really when we are striving for a high performance building for a green building, all these various disciplines need to work in an integrated or collaborative fashion to find solutions that really drive performance. So instead of the process where the pieces get handed off from one professional or one consultant to another, in an integrated process, all these disciplines are meant to be working together to um, find the interactions and find the ways that, you know, find the points of leverage to drive an improved outcome, right? To, to look for a high performance building, to look for a sustainable building. Right, again, all the different components, all the different systems, um, in an integrated design process, looking for ways to make all those things work together 
such that the 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 sum is greater than the individual parts, right? Ideally, we want to make two plus two equal five here, right? We want to make all these things work together and produce a high performance building. So what are some of the ways we do that? <clears throat> uh, discovery, uh, we expand the typical pre-designed phase. And what we're trying to do here is we want to set goals for the project. What are the, what are the environmental goals? What are the performance goals that we want this project to meet? Right. obviously the, the owner has a, typically has a program in mind what they want the building to do. But in discovery, we expand that to say, what are the goals that we want this building to meet? What, how much energy do we want it to use, et cetera, et cetera. What are the goals of this project? Right. And the key aspects of this discovery process, we obviously want to start early. You know, the earlier in the design process we start to do these things, the more likely it is that we are going to um, be successful here. So one thing that folks have learned that, you know, making the building green, making the building sustainable or high performance is not something that you paste on at the tail end of the design process, right? It's not something you do during construction documents. You have to start early and look for these ways that things fit together. You got to make sure that you follow through on the commitments. Again, we're looking for ways of, of producing long, not only first cost, but also long-term savings in terms of operation and maintenance. We want to make sure we include all the various different stakeholders in this process. Right, so instead of the traditional process where we hand work off from one person to the next, we want to replace that with collaborations of small groups working as a whole. We want to develop the design and plan collaboratively. Right? Ideally, we want to have ideas being developed by the team, um, refined by small groups, brought back, and hopefully, and consider those and make decisions, right? That's what an integrate, integrative design process looks like. So again, we're establishing clear goals and commitments, right? Again, when, when Triton College redeveloped or renovated the H building, somewhere along the line, someone may have set the goal and said, I want this building to be LEED certified. I wanted to achieve, you know, not only these objectives in terms of the program, but also these objectives in terms of performance of the building. Uh, brainstorm, develop ideas. We want to hear from all the team members, research, refine, look for synergies, look for ways that things are going to fit together and make sure that we know how we're going to measure, right? Metrics are things that you can measure. Targets would be what level of achievement do we, we hope to meet. One way of doing this is through what's called a charrette. Right? A charrette is a, is a structured design process where these sorts of things happen, right? Architects oftentimes would like to do charrettes, right? Charrettes are a way of getting lots of ideas on the table and working through those ideas, you know, having lots of people interacting to come up with the best solution, right? That's part of what it takes to have a high performance building. It's not just one person, it's a, it's a team of people. One of the concepts here is stakeholder, right? Stakeholders are all the different people that are impacted by the outcome of the project, right? They have an interest in the success of the project. They could be within the organization or outside the organization. Obviously, um, all the project team members that we saw a couple slides ago, those are all stakeholders, but some of the other stakeholders might be the, the 
building users or the occupants, the community members uh, in the community surrounding the building or the facility staff. Okay, well, we're going to do something a little different here than what we've done before. First of all, anyone have any comments or questions? I'm, I'm watching the clock here and trying my best to do all the stuff within the time we have available to us. Okay, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide you guys into, uh, I see 12 of you, so I'm actually going to, I'm going to divide you into three groups and I'll push the button here and that'll happen magically. But what I want you to do is, and let me see if I can show you where this stuff is. Uh, right under, way at the bottom of course materials here, right under lead GA materials and practice questions. Um, I've started to post some practice questions, right? Because ultimately we are, we are preparing to take an exam, to take a test, that two hour test with a hundred multiple choice questions. So um, I took some questions out of the book. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna break you up into groups and my apologies, I probably should have had you download these things ahead of time, I'll be more I'll have this all better set up next week. What I'd like you to do is to, uh, when I break you into groups, go and grab some of these questions and try to answer that, answer them. We'll spend, uh, we've got about, uh, we'll spend about 12 or 15 minutes having you work on these and then we'll get back together and see what you found. Um, again, what I'm hoping to do is um, to give you guys a chance to, uh, not only hear my lecture, but take a look at the questions that might that you might find on the lead GA test that relate to what I just talked about. So we're going to give this a shot. Yes, any questions? Sorry. Are we doing that first set, the lead credentials or the sustainable design? Or well, um, I've covered. I've actually tried to cover all three of those things. So okay. I would say try to tackle all three of them. We will see how this goes if we don't get through this all tonight. Why don't you do them one at a time, start in the order that they're posted, right? Because that's, that's what I just talked about in my lectures, right? Lead credentials was before the break and then sustainable design concepts and integrative design process was what I did afterwards. So uh, why don't you tackle them? We'll spend, uh, Let's spend 10 or 11 minutes seeing how it goes, and uh, we may have to refine this a little bit next week. But here, this is the way that I'm going to try to do things here, where I I present information, then I give you a chance to practice. Make sense? Let me uh, let me uh, go back here and. Uh, break you into three groups of four attendees. Voila, and uh, you guys work on that and I will check in with you guys, right? Does that make sense? We shall see, let's go.